All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third seminar in our series of magnetospheric seminars. Uh, today's seminar is going to be given by Ferdinand Plasch uh, from the Australia, Austrian Academy of Sciences. Ferdinand graduated with a diploma in physics in 2007 and completed his doctoral degree at the University of Braunschweig Institute of Technology in 2011. Oh, and um, pardon me, Zoom has done something funny. Uh, following the completion of his doctorate, Ferdinand went to UCLA as an assistant researcher working with the Themis satellites. Since 2013, Ferdinand has been a researcher at the Austri Austrian Academy of Sciences in the Space Research Institute and a lecturer at Graz University of Technology and the University of Applied Sciences at Wiener Neustadt. Ferdinand's main research focus is on solar wind magnetosphere ionosphere interaction including the magneto sheath, which is what he will be talking about today. He has led an ISI team investigating jets downstream of collisionless shocks and is currently a co-lead of the ISI team for shocks across the heliosphere, system-specific or universal physical processes with Heli Hedela. Ferdinand has also contributed significantly to the calibration of spacecraft magnetometers and the development of cross calibration methods as part of the Themis MMS magnetometer teams and is currently a co-I on the Bepi Colombo, SMILE and JUICE missions. So today we welcome Ferdinand who will be presenting on the Earth's magnetosphere. Uh, you can take it away, Ferdinand. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Thank you very much for the invitation, actually, and for the opportunity to speak here today. And also many thanks to the team at the Space Plasma Physics, the Space Plasma Physics team here at the Institute for uh, some content and comments on this talk. Okay, let me see if I can show a laser pointer. I can. Okay, so the topic of this talk is the magnetosheath. So let's start with the first and probably most important question. What is actually the magnetosheath? Well, we all know that um, the geomagnetic field represents an obstacle to the solar wind. So the solar wind cannot easily penetrate the magnetopause. On the other hand, the solar wind is supermagnetosonic in the frame of reference of the Earth. And that means the information that there is an obstacle ahead cannot travel easily upstream into the solar wind. So as a consequence, a bow shock should emerge, what you see here, where the solar wind is compressed and decelerated to submagnetosonic speeds. And then in the region behind that bow shock, downstream of it, between the bow shock and the magnetopause, uh, the solar wind can then flow around the obstacle given here by the magnetopause and the geomagnetic field. That region in between, this is the magnetosheath. Um, the next question would, of course, be why is the magnetosheath important? Why should we care about this region? And the answer is pretty simple. When we care about solar wind magnetosphere interactions, um, then the magnetosheath is a key component in that interaction. Because the solar wind cannot directly interact with the geomagnetic field or with the magnetosphere at the magnetopause, it is always processed first by the magnetosheath. And so the processes that act there are important in the context, on the context of solar wind magnetosphere interactions. On the other hand, we had also the foreshock, a talk on the foreshock um, last week by Halle Hietala. And the foreshock is a region upstream in the solar wind that is connected, magnetically connected to the bow shock, where um, particles are reflected from the bow shock and can go along the magnetic field lines and with an E-cross B-drift actually into this foreshock region and then interact there with the incoming solar wind and lead to a plethora of um, different phenomena, including um, significant amplitude ULF wave field that then is convected with the solar wind uh, downstream to the bow shock and also into the magnetosheath. So already from this figure, it is pretty, pretty clear that the magnetosheath here on this side, where there is no, bow uh, no foreshock uh, upstream, and the magnetosheath on this side, where there is a foreshock upstream, should have different properties. And so one of the important uh, points of, uh, within this talk, and also of the last talk about the bow shock and the foreshock, is actually the question, what is the angle between the local interplanetary magnetic field and the lo local bow shock normal? 
That is something that you can see here on this side. Here, where there is no bow shock upstream, um, the angle between the local bow shock normal and the interplanetary magnetic field is pretty large. And when it is above 45 degrees, we call this uh, se section of the bow shock quasi perpendicular. And we can also extend that nomenclature to the sheath and call the sheath section here quasi perpendicular. On the other hand, here, um, the angle between the bow shock normal and the interplanetary magnetic field is below 45 degrees. And we call this section of the bow shock quasi parallel and also the uh, associated uh, magnetosheath volume quasi parallel. And obviously this is affected by the foreshock upstream and this part is less affected or not affected by a foreshock. So what is the uh, outline of my talk? Now that we have this introduction, uh, my talk is uh, structured in three sections. I will first uh, talk about global structures in the magnetosheath. I will then go on to speak about local processes in the magnetosheath. And then there will be a third section at the end about external transients that affect the magnetosheath plasma. Okay, so let's start with global structures. Um, it's interesting to note that actually the global structure or the, the basic structure of the magnetosheath has been known for quite a while, almost since the beginning of the space era. And there is this very important paper by Spreiter et al, um, where they uh, report results of some gas dynamic theory modeling or hydrodynamic uh, modeling, where they assume the bow shock and the flow uh, behind the bow shock downstream of it uh, purely to be uh, described by hydrodynamics. The magnetopause is assumed to be a tangential discontinuity, where of course you, have to, you need to have pressure balance across it. Um, the whole problem is uh, thought to be axisymmetric ar around the, the uh, Earth-Sun line. And the pressure inside the magnetopause, so on the Earthward side, is given by twice or provided by twice the geomagnetic dipole field at that position. And when you take that and do it hydrodynamic calculations, so no magnetic field or J cross B involved, you get actually a very accurate description already of the basic properties of the magnetosheath. For example, the compression of the plasma across the bow shock in the subsolar magnetosheath, the deceleration of the plasma across the bow shock, and then the reacceleration due to the uh, gradient pressure uh, term um, along the flanks. And you can get the streamlines also, as you can see here. So this is a streamline in the solar wind. You cross the bow shock. The plasma is deflected in the magnetosheath and uh, goes along here tangentially to the, to the magnetopause, which is by, given by this uh, boundary. Another thing that this model also gets right is that the acceleration of the, of the plasma is pretty fast. So of course, in the solar wind, we have uh, supersonic or supermagnetosonic plasma. Here we need uh, submagnetosonic plasmas. Um, but then the acceleration is pretty quick and we reach the sonic line already a little bit off the subsolar section where Mach goes uh, again above one. You can add to this uh, flow model, model also the magnetic field in a frozen in manner uh, afterwards. And that is what is done here on the right figure where a Parker spiral IMF has been added and superposed to the fields just being convected with the field. And you can see what this does to the magnetic field so you can see here the 45 degree IMF, uh, classical Parker spiral IMF, which is then draped over the magneto pause here. And you have a change in the direction of the magnetic field uh, on this side, which would correspond to the dawn side um, of the magneto sheath or the quasi parallel side. And then an increase in the magnetic field on the dusk or quasi perpendicular side that you see down here. And I think I will actually switch off the laser pointer because this is not, um, it is very slow, I see. Okay, so if you want to have the same picture actually given from uh, spacecraft observations, it is not it is such an easy task. And the reason is that the bow shock and the magnetopause are actually very dynamic, um, very dynamic boundaries. And so you'd have to find a way to account for this, uh, for the dynamics and to take that out if you then want to pinpoint a certain uh, observation in the magnetosheath to a certain point on the map. And the way to do this is uh, to use the magnetosheath interplanetary medium, MIPM reference frame. And in this frame, uh, the x-axis would go against the solar wind flow. It would be an aberrated Earth-Sun line. Um, the IMF would lie in the xy plane, 
uh, but come into the bow shock from the minus y side. So we have the quasi parallel bow shock and magneto sheath on the minus y side here in this sketch on the lower part in the right figure. Um, this would be the quasi parallel shock and sheath. Um, and then we need also a bow shock and magnetopause models, which in this case, in the uh, paper by Dimok and Nukuri, is given by the Verigin 2001 and Schuett al 1998 models. And what you would do is you would uh, locate your spacecraft between, on a radial uh, line, between uh, the magnetopause and the bow shock and calculate a fractional distance between the two uh, between the two boundaries. And of course, you would adapt uh, the, the um, uh, bow shock and magnetopause model to your situation upstream to the solar wind conditions. And then if you want to place this on a static map where the bow shock and the magnetopause are fixed for average conditions, you would repeat that, take again this angle here and the fractional distance between the two bow shocks and you can locate your observation to a specific point on the map. And that is what has been done by uh, Dimok and Nukuri, for example, here. So what you see here on the left is a uh, plot of the relative velocities, velocity in the magneto sheath uh, versus magneto uh, velocity in the solar wind. And you can clearly see the deceleration here in the subsolar region and the reacceleration along the flanks. And here past the terminator, the plasma is actually reaching uh, solar wind speeds again, as you can see here. Um, there's a slight tendency to see larger velocities on, on the dusk side, on the quasi-perpendicular side. This you can, would actually be able to see better in a mean plot instead of the median, uh, uh, what I'm showing here. On the right side, uh, you see the same plot, but actually for the magnetic field magnitude. So it's B in the magneto sheath over B in the solar wind. Um, and what you see here is the draping of the... Um, IMF over the magnetopause, so an increase in the magnetic field in the subsolar region. And since the uh, quasi-parallel shock in this frame of reference is always located here on the minus Y side, we have, due to the draping pattern, uh, tend to have a smaller magnetic field uh, magnitude on this side, rather than on this side, you can see these uh, yellow dots actually here on the, on the positive, uh, y play, uh, positive Y play, uh, positive Y area. Um, one in the symmetry is also very clear here is that the magneto sheath appears to be thinner um, in the dawn or quasi parallel sector than in the dusk or quasi perpendicular sector. And the reason might be or will be that the bow shock is actually a fast standing fast mode wave and the fast mode can propagate faster across the magnetic field than along the magnetic field. And that means that the uh, bow shock will be actually a little bit further out here on the dusk or quasi-perpendicular side uh, in comparison to the quasi-parallel side. There are a few other asymmetries that are um, important, particularly when we are dealing with low Alvin Mach number solar wind conditions. So what you see here in the middle is a um, MHD simulation by Nishino et al under low Alvin Mach number conditions with MA around two, so usually like eight or 10 is maybe uh, 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 usual. Um, and you can see two things here. First of all, you can see that the density, which is color coded in this uh, uh, figure is, um, the maximum of the density is not exactly subsolar, but it's actually shifted towards the dawn or quasi parallel side. Another thing that you can see is that the streamlines, which are uh, completely straight here in the solar wind, they actually indicate that when we are here at the dawn side, where we see the maximum uh, density, we see a duskward flow in the dawn magneto sheath. And both these phenomena can be explained actually by the rankine hergonio conditions and also by kink and the magnetic field at the bow shock. And uh, the reason that the magnetic field is actually important here, uh, or, or the fact that the magnetic field is important here is also the reason why this effect is enhanced when we are dealing with low Alve Mach number solar wind. And you can see this, as if, um, this effect also in observations here on the right side. This is uh, from a paper from Dimok et al. 2016, where you see the density um, uh, maximum again shifted towards the dawn or quasi parallel side because again this is in the MIPM uh, reference frame. Okay, uh, further asymmetries can be or information about further asymmetries can be found in multiple papers by Dimok. There's a whole series actually uh, on this uh, looking for um, 
magnetosheath properties from Themis uh, observations. And then in two papers, one from uh, Brian Walsh from 2012, another one dealing with the symmetries also in the magnetosheath, but the magneto, uh, magnetosphere, but the magnetosheath is one section of that from Andrew Walsh from 2014. And I've taken this table from this uh, letter paper where you can see a couple of things that I've already told you. For example, that the ion density should be, ion density should be enhanced on the dawn side. So is the ion temperature. Uh, the magnetic field magnitude is enhanced on the dusk side. And then we, if we go down here, the magnetic field uh, changes or magnetic field turbulence is typically very much enhanced on the quasi-parallel side. We will come to this later on. And so we will come also to these two points here, mirror mode waves and also ion cyclotron waves, which are more prevalent on the quasi-perpendicular side. So, so far we've had a look into um, kind of like the equatorial or ecliptic plane under the assumption that we have, for example, a Parker spiral IMF. Now let's have a look what happens when the IMF is, for example, strongly northward. Well, we know that when we have strongly northward IMF, um, reconnection at the magnetopause is diminished and the magnetic field can kind of pile up uh, against the magnetopause in the subsolar region and the plasma depletion layer can form. And the plasma depletion layer is a layer of enhanced magnetic field and squeezed out or deep, uh, depleted uh, plasma density. And you can see this also in this um, observations by Fan et al in the paper from 1994. Uh, for a low magnetic shear uh, magnetopause, when we approach the magnetopause, we see the density actually going down. And we see here the magnetic pressure going up and in kind of like a gradual uh, fashion until we uh, meet here the magnetopause. And that is different to the high magnetic shear magnetopause, where we have uh, usually more constant uh, properties on the magnetosheath side, and then a more, uh, a stronger gradient, a more jump type uh, magnetopause transition. Um, the plasma depletion layer also, or the on the strongly northward IMF conditions, we see also strong acceleration of these flux tubes and the associated plasma on the flanks, uh, along the flanks of the magnetopause in the magnetosheath due to magnetic pressure gradient and magnetic tension forces. And this is something that has been modeled by Lavro et al in 2007, which you can see here. Um, in their event, they saw a solar wind uh, velocity of about 650 kilometers per second. But then in the magnetosheath at the flank, they saw that the magnetosheath plasma already had velocities above 1,000 kilometers per second. And the, the reason was the strong acceleration of the plasma above the solar wind uh, velocity levels in the magnetosheath. And uh, so you can see this here. The solar wind has, is color coded in green, so uh, corresponding to 650 kilometers per second. And then here further down the flanks in the magnetosheath, you, uh, you reach higher values than the solar wind values, which is kind of atypical. What happens here? We are dealing here with, a lo with low Mach number conditions in the solar wind. And here, uh, gradient of the plasma pressure is actually not the dominant uh, accelerating force in the magnetosheath. You see this here in the lower panel. Instead, J cross B is actually the main force here and accelerates the plasma along the flanks um, to values above the, the uh, velocities in the, in the solar wind. And also what we see in this plot is that this is not as a pure magnetic slingshot effect. So it's not just the magnetic tension that is being released here, but it's also the um, uh, magnetic pressure uh, gradient, which uh, plays a major role here, as you can see here. So this part of J cross B is actually shown here at the, in the dashed line and also plays a major role in the acceleration here of the plasma. So always when we are dealing with accelerated flows along the flanks of the magnetopause, what might come to your mind might be the kelvin helmholtz instability. And so it, um, enhanced flows, of course, what you see here is the classical criterion for incompressible plasmas actually for the kelvin helmholtz instability. Definitely uh, increased magnetic shear is favorable uh, for this instability and for building up uh, in amplitude of this uh, kelvin helmholtz waves. And for straight or geomagnetic, uh, for, uh, for straight due north IMF, uh, we will have a kelvin helmholtz unstable region here in the equatorial plane. And also this magnetic field will, will help as actually the instability to develop 
because uh, k dot b would be, um, or k and b would be at an angle of 90 degrees here along the flanks. Um, when we have a kelvin helmholtz instability developing, we would uh, expect um, a certain wave steepening pattern as shown down here uh, on the um, lower left side. So what we uh, would expect is a more inclined uh, wave surfaces, magnetopause surfaces on the leading edges, less inclined, but with a higher uh, gradient actually um, surfaces on the trailing edges. But what has also been related to uh, strongly northward IMF and to the buildup of the plasma depletion layer has been the so-called inverse wave steepening, where you have the more inclined edges here at the trailing, the trailing edges to be more inclined than the leading edges. And this has been observed, for example, here by uh, Chen and Kivison in 1993. Um, I've also published some observations on this in 2013 in a Thames paper, where you can see, or where here in this case, uh, Chen and Kivison speculate that is actually the magnetic field, uh, the strong magnetic field uh, and the acceleration by the magnetic field that might be driving these inverse deepening at the magnetopause. Um, last in the section, close, the current closure through the magnetosheath. Uh, this is actually work by Lopez et al from 2010. So what we see here is, is uh, the following observations. Um, when we take the solar wind and we see the compression at the bow shock, um, the magnetic field, of course, jumps and uh, becomes enhanced. And so over the bow shock, we see also, we should see also a current, uh, obviously. And uh, that current goes against the electric field. Um, uh, so we ha don't have a plasma heating, but we actually have a generator region here. And uh, this current goes along the bow shock, no matter what the IMF condition is actually. And this current has to be closed somewhere. And the way to close it is through the magnetosheath. And then maybe here at the magnetopause where the, um, the, this current system can connect into magnetospheric current systems. Um, now, when we have southward IMF, of course we have enhanced reconnection at the magnetopause. Um, and that will also drive the ionospheric potential reconnection by these reconnection uh, pro processes. So when we have increased um, southward IMF, we should see that potential drop increasing until a saturation is reached. And the question is, when that saturation is reached, what happens? Well, the point is that not all the flux that comes in here through the bow shock from the solar wind can actually reach the magnetopause because the flow is deflected usually by a uh, minus gradient of P force. Um, but if you increase the magnetic field at a certain point, J cross B will take over and that will become the dominant force deflecting the plasma. And this will decrease the solar wind geoeffective length. So so-called the amount of flux or the length where the flux comes in that is actually able to reach the magnetopause and reconnect there, which limits the growth of reconnection rate. And so you can see that also currents flowing in the magnetosheath actually have a global magnetospheric uh, impact. Okay, so this was uh, uh, the first part um, about global structures. And now let me continue actually with local processes. So far we have looked into distributions, symmetries in the magnetosheath, the plasma depletion layer and global current systems. So let's start this section on the quasi perpendicular uh, part of the sheath down here where you see the star. Just as a reminder, that's uh, where we have no foreshock upstream, but where we see in the magnetosheath an increased uh, ion temperature anisotropy, as you can see here on the um, upper left corner, where the temperature in the perpendicular components would be larger than T parallel. And what happens then? Well, this can lead to two instabilities developing. First of all, under high beta conditions, it can lead to mirror modes uh, developing in the magnetosheath. So this is, these are kind of like a spatially periodic pattern of magnetic models, where you have the magnetic field and the density strongly anticorrelated. So you have kind of like, I mean, this is a very oversimplified picture, but you have regions where you have an increased density of the plasma and then in between, you have regions where the magnetic field is strongly increased. And if you fly with the spacecraft through this, you would see this strong anticorrelation between B and N. And this is something that also has been observed, for example, here by Ray et al uh, in Equator S data. Here you see actually the pressures. This is the plasma pressure and the magnetic pressure being strongly anticorrelated. 
whereas the total pressure kind of stays the same over these magnetic bottles. So these structures are a pressure balance. The magnetic, uh, the mirror mode in, does not move in the plasma rest frame. So it's just convected with the plasma flow. Sizes are several ion gyro radii, a couple of hundreds of kilometers, maybe 500 kilometers, something like this. Um, and interestingly, actually, when you think of, okay, the, the bottles are just convected and just flushed out of the magnetosheath with a so, uh, with with plasma flow, then they should have no impact on the magnetopause. But that is not true. Actually, Lightin et al. in 2010, they report that uh, mirror modes can actually modulate magnetopause uh, reconnection by the changing uh, plasma beta pattern uh, along the magnetopause. Inside of mirror modes, lion drawers, so-called lion drawers, which are Whistler waves, uh, may develop. These are right-hand polarized electromagnetic waves that propagate parallel to the magnetic field. And they correlate here with the decreases in the magnetic field, as you can see here uh, from a paper of Smith, Smith and Surutani from 1976. See here the depression in the magnetic field and here the Whistler wave appearing. And or here from Baum Johann et al. from 1999, where you can see within the trough of the magnetic, uh, this magnetic trough, you can see these higher frequency waves uh, appearing. They usually come in, in packets of like second, two seconds, low amplitudes and frequencies around 100 hertz. Although here um, in, this, uh, in this example, we are more uh, talking about maybe 40 to 60 hertz actually. Um, from what I have read, there is no consensus of what actually causes uh, these line roars or these Whistler waves. Some, uh, some people report that they may be caused by an electron temperature anisotropy. Other people report that the electron heat flux uh, might be responsible for that, but I think this is, this is not uh, completely closed yet. Um, in, instead of mirror modes in low beta plasmas, you can also have, or you can have preferentially ion cyclotron waves uh, developing. Uh, these are transverse, left-hand circularly polarized waves that typically appear around like a hertz, so below the ion cyclotron uh, frequency. Um, you can see here, they also propagate parallel to B. You can see here um, an example actually from Messenger reported by Sundberg et al. 2015. You see these very nice uh, transverse oscillations. Um, or here on the right side, you see uh, EMIC waves in the plasma depletion layer. There, obviously, you have a very strong magnetic field, so low plasma beta, which is good for these waves. And also, you have here a large temperature anisotropy, as you can see in the lower two panels of this, of this uh, figure. And then here, um, these ion cyclotron waves are developing around one hertz, as you can see in the second panel. So this was... Uh, um, these were waves, linear mode waves on the quasi-perpendicular side. Of course, you don't have always linear mode waves, but you can also have turbulent fluctuations everywhere in the magnetosheath. And so what uh, the figure on the left side shows you is again a map in the MIPM uh, reference frame showing you fluctuations in the magnetic field in the uh, range between 0.1 and 2 Hertz. Compressional component is the left two panels, transverse component, the right two panels, then the upper two show you uh, this map for uh, solar wind velocities below 400 kilometers per second, so slow solar wind, and the, uh, uh, the bottom two panels for solar wind velocities above 400 kilometers per second, uh, so uh, fast solar wind. And what you can see is that these fluctuations are strongly enhanced for fast solar wind and strongly enhanced in, on the quasi-parallel uh, side of the magnetosheath um, as you can see here, if you compare the quasi-perpendicular positive Y with the quasi-parallel negative uh, Y side. And you can see this also in, in, uh, in uh, event studies. So you don't have to look into the statistical picture. And that's something that you see here on the right side. Um, this are MM these are MMS observations reported by Jordanova et al. very recently. We start with the spacecraft in the quasi-perpendicular sheath and then transition over into the quasi-parallel sheath and you see a very drastic change uh, in, uh, in the fluctuation level and uh, also in the, for example, here in the temperature anisotropy that is stronger on the quasi-perpendicular side. Then you have slightly higher and more fluctuating plasma beta on the quasi-parallel side. And you can see this very strongly also in the magnetic field fluctuations that I will show you on the next slide. So here you see the quasi-perpendicular panels on the left side, again, quasi-parallel panels on the right side, 
And from top to bottom, we have the magnetic field, uh, the partial variance of increments, which is kind of the difference between, normalized difference between two neighboring spacecraft, field rotations between two spacecraft, and uh, here in gray, kilometer uh, J. And you can see that, especially on the quasi-parallel side, the magnetic field is much more fluctuating. And you have a lot of uh, thin current sheets also in the quasi-parallel magnetic sheet that are associated with reconnection. And this reconnection has, of course, been studied with MMS. But also before that, it has been studied with uh, cluster observations by Alessandro Retinot and uh, co-workers, and there is a paper out in uh, 2007 um, describing this. And in this case, cluster was in the quasi-parallel magnetic sheet, where we have strong uh, fluctuations, and they were seeing a current sheet of the scale of an iron inertial length, um, so on the order of like 100 kilometers and like one second of spacecraft time series data. And uh, this was really on the edge actually of the cluster capabilities, but they are uh, showing in this paper in situ evidence for a reconnection and crossing of the ion diffusion region, just kind of ticking off all the expected features uh, that, uh, of that region. And then of course, MMS observations are much better suited and designed actually uh, to study uh, magnetic reconnection. And you have a couple of papers one of them, for example, Wörisch et al. Um, reporting reconnection in the magnetosheath. Also, Fan et al. Uh, a little bit more recently, um, reporting electron, uh, electron only reconnection at thin current sheets. And the figure that you see there on the right side is actually from that paper. Here, the current sheet scale is actually two orders of magnitude lower in comparison to what Retinova was observing. Few electron inertial lengths couple of kilometers and of course in the spacecraft, uh, in the spacecraft time series, so below 50 nan milliseconds actually of what you are observing. And they are observing intense electron outflows and currents, plasma heating, but no um, ion scale currents and no ion jets. So that's why this is termed electron only reconnection. Um, of course, you can also have reconnection at the magnetopause, and I will not go into this in detail here because this will probably be a major subject in the next seminar talk in two weeks. Um, but when you have, one thing I want to mention here, when you have magnetic reconnection occurring at the magnetopause, you might see away from this reconnection point so-called flux transfer events. And uh, these are associated to reconnected flux, uh, flux tubes, so something like this here you have open magnetic flux and this flux tubes go through the magnetopause or at the magnetopause move tailward. Um, and in the magnetosheath, uh, as shown here by simulation results by Yarvin et al. 2018, they may actually drive uh, fast mode bow waves. So here you can see, for example, uh, an FDE here and a bow wave um, that extends into the magnetosheath. And then uh, a little bit further ahead, you see an increased ion parallel temperature. So these bow waves, at least in the simulations, are in this simulation, are able to accelerate ions to 30 keV and are the reason for time energy dispersive ion signatures. I'm not sure if this has been confirmed in, the, in, in observations, but at least you can see this in simulations. And this is um, the end of my second section. So I've talked a little bit about uh, local processes in the quasi-perpendicular sheath where we have a large ion temperature anisotropy mirror modes um, can be observed or can develop. And within those mirror mode troughs, you can see lion rods, the whistler waves. Um, you can also see ion cyclotron waves uh, developing where you have a higher magnetic field and a lower plasma beta. And then in general, in the magneto sheath, the magnetosheath is a very turbulent region, so you have turbulence occurring, occurring in particular on the quasi-parallel side where you can have or you have a lot of thin current sheets where reconnection can also occur. And of course, you can also have reconnection at the magnetopause that can have an effect um, on the plasma in the magnetosheath. And now I will go on with the last section, external transients. So external uh, transients can of course be almost everything. Um, let's start with some solar wind variations. So it's something that I have already talked about, of course, IMF variations. If you have a change in the uh, IMF direction, it will change your foreshock location or it can change your foreshock location. 
And that would mean that the character of the magnetosheath at a particular point in the magnetosheath could very drastically change just from the change from quasi-perpendicular to quasi-parallel sheath. Uh, furthermore, the magnetopause is also more expanded or tends to be more expanded downstream of the quasi-parallel uh, shock. Um, this also ties into the, the point that actually on the quasi-parallel side, you tend to have slightly thinner magnetosheath region that on the dusk or quasi-perpendicular side. You can also have pressure variations running through the system. For example, as a single pulse or pre periodic solar wind pressure variations, for example, reported by CAPCO et al. So what, what they were looking at uh, were um, dynamic pressure observations in the solar wind, uh, given by the wind spacecraft. And you see here a spectrum actually on the, on the top right side, the top right panel. Um, and then they were also making observations by, with GOES inside the magnetosphere. And they see a very good uh, correlation and actually correspondence between the spectra of the GOES and wind observations. And obviously, these changes or the variations somehow have to make it from the solar wind through the magnetosheath into the magnetosphere. Um, other more drastic events, CMEs or magnetic clouds uh, of CMEs, there's actually a series of papers uh, from Lucille Turk discussing how the, the magnetic field and the magnetic clouds drape over the magnetopause and affect the magnetosheath. And last but not least, solar wind magnetic holes. Uh, these are isolated depressions in the magnetic field, um, pressure balanced by an increase in density in the solar wind. And they typically have um, uh, sizes of maybe 10,000 kilometers, 20,000 kilometers, something like this. And of course, when they enter the magnetosheath, they will be actually uh, uh, processed when they go through the bow shock and enter the magnetosheath, but they are still, can still be observed inside the magnetosheath. And at Earth, this is something which I would like to point out here. At Earth, um, these structures are local things uh, which can be described by MHD, so fluid scale. Uh, at different environments, this might be completely different. So what you see here in the um, right lower panel, this is actually a sketch pertaining to uh, work uh, with Rosetta data uh, near Comet 67 Petroleum of Gerasimenko and a magnetic hole interacting with the plasma environment of the comet. So the cometo sheath, so, so to say, and how it is uh, decelerated there by a magnetic pile up and deformed. And in this environment, in the magnetic hole is not of local scale, but global scale. And it's not fluid, but, or, or cannot describe by fluid theory, but actually affects kinetic scales because the, uh, the sizes of uh, these holes are more or less comparable to the gyro radio of heavy ions. So you can see that in two different environments, the same solar wind variation or the same solar wind transient can actually have, um, can have completely different effects. Um, furthermore, uh, external transients, of course, also foreshock transients can very heavily affect uh, the magnetosheath. Uh, so what you see here is uh, two things, hot flow anomaly, a hot flow anomaly and a foreshock bubble that have been discussed by uh, Heli last week. Um, hot flow anomaly is kind of like a tangential discontinuity intersecting with bow shock, where you have at least on one side the electric field pointing towards the discontinuity and uh, you can kind of channel reflected, uh, reflected hot plasma channeling into this discontinuity and forming kind of a hot tenuous core around the discontinuity and then uh, compression sheets um, then on either side of the discontinuity. And this can not only be observed inside the, the foreshock or upstream of the bow shock, but also inside the magneto sheath where you can see this leads to a complete change in the pressure distribution and an outbulging of the magnetopause. And this can be also be observed by spacecraft like here in a paper by Martin Archer et al. with Themis observations, where you see these uh, uh, strong sunward flows in the magnetosheath before hitting the magnetopause, and then the whole thing passes over and you end up with the magnetosheath again. Same thing can happen with uh, foreshock bubbles. Observationally, they are actually very similar to hot flow anomalies, but uh, they have a different cause. In this case, um, it's a rotational discontinuity in the solar wind is the cause, but which is not intersecting with the bow shock, but uh, which is magnetically connected to the bow shock. So you can have th uh, super thermal uh, 
ions backstreaming from the bow shock and kind of like excavating this uh, bubble here on the, on the sunward side, on the upstream side of the rotational discontinuity. And on top of that here on, at the end of the bubble on the sunward side, also a, a new shock can form. And if the whole structure is convected with the solar wind back to the bow shock and when it hits the bow shock, it can lead to a, a similar strong pressure disturbance in the, in the, in the, in the magnetosheath leading to sunward flows and, and uh, a complete redistribution actually and reforming of the bow shock with the shock that you have here in the, at the foreshock bubble. Um, another interesting uh, phenomenon or transient are so-called high-speed jets. Now high-speed jets in the magnetosheath are not strictly foreshock uh, transients because they are not seen in the, in the foreshock or upstream of the bow shock. They're generated at the bow shock. At the same time, they, ha they are strongly connected to the bow shock. So let's start first of all, what are high-speed jets? High-speed jets in the magnetosheath are local enhancements in dynamic pressure. And you can see this here in the, in the panels on the right side. We have magnetic field, ion velocity, and dynamic pressure in the x direction. So you can see here during the high-speed jet, the minus x velocity is increasing. And due to this, you have a strong increase in the dynamic pressure. Usually in the subsolar magnetosheath, you have dynamic pressures that are about a tenth of the solar wind dynamic pressure. In this case, the dynamic pressure actually reaches, even surpasses the solar wind dynamic pressure. And this is not uncommon at all for these high-speed jets where you can reach dynamic pressures multiple times uh, the one of the solar wind. The occurrence of these jets is mainly um, in the quasi-parallel magnetosheath. That means downstream of an undulated shock. And the reason might be the undulated shock itself. So the parallel bow shock, of course, is not very like steady but uh, you have uh, ULF waves and you have uh, slams, so short, large amplitude magnetic structures hitting the bow shock all the time and forming and preforming it. And so you can think of the bow shock of being an undulated or rippled structure. And as shown in the sketch by Hirtel et al from 2012, um, solar wind plasma may actually be able to pass this bow shock at this inclined shock surfaces where it will not be or little, be little decelerated. And so you will end up with compressed, but little decelerated, little thermalized uh, a plasma, maybe focused plasma inside the magnetosheath here. And sometimes for a fraction of these jets, which is something like 14% or so, the plasma is even found to be super magnetosonic inside the magnetosheath, which means that as the plasma approaches the magnetopause, there should be a second secondary shock forming inside the magnetosheath, which has already been observed in this paper um, by Hirtel et al. And uh, jets are actually very interesting conceptually because uh, since jets can bridge uh, the entire way from the, from the bow shock, go all the way through the magnetosheath and hit the magnetopause, they're able to link processes in the foreshock and at the bow shock and their scales, temporal spatial scales, with processes or effects that happen at the magnetopause uh, and then beyond also in the, magneto, in the magnetosphere. And these effects you can see here in this, in this uh, very nice uh, sketch. So first of all, you can have um, indentations of the magnetopause, magnetopause surface rays, or even reconnection, modulation of reconnection at the impact site. You may have ULF waves inside the magnetosphere. And if you go, um, uh, even from the ground, you may, able to, you may be able to observe signatures of those jets in, forms, in form of enhanced ionospheric flows, ground magnetic field signatures, or dayside uh, auroral features. And uh, inside the magnetosheath, which is of course the main theme of this, um, of this talk, jets may, are way faster than the ambient magnetosheath plasma. So they will modify the magnetic fields when they pass through the magnetosheath and straighten them here in the wake region of the jets. They will also cause, or they cause, vertical motion of plasma. Um, and this vertical motion means that um, uh, magnetosheath plasma is actually driven out or pushed out of the way ahead of the jet, uh, decelerated in their flow actually, or flowing backwards uh, around the jet, um, nearby the jet and then filling the wake region again. And this kind of creates a vertical flow around the jets, but also inside the jet because not all the jet plasma is going at the same velocity. Um, furthermore, here in a recent uh, study by Liu et al, very recent study, uh, 
Jets are also able to accelerate particles at jet-driven bow waves. I have also said that jets can uh, trigger or, or form secondary shocks inside the magnetosheath, and these uh, can also accelerate uh, particles ahead of the jets, as you can see here in this, in this sketch. Um, one slide about the jet impact. I've already said jets can strongly indent the magnetopause. This is something that you can see here in this figure. So from Shu et al, where a magnetosheath a jets hit the magnetopause and creates an indentation about one RE deep and two RE wide. Furthermore, jets may able to or can uh, trigger reconnection either by current sheet compression at the magnetopause or change in the, uh, or change in the local magnetic field geometry at the impact site. And uh, follow on on that, Nukuri et al have uh, very recently shown that actually a jet may be able even to trigger uh, a substrum in the tail just by giving this little bit of extra magnetic flux added to the tail uh, when it triggers reconnection at the magnetopause. Okay, so this was my uh, last section about external transients. So here I have told you something about uh, solar wind transients. Uh, affecting the magnetosheath, IMF variations, of course, changing the foreshock location, pressure pulses going through the sheath, uh, magnetic clouds and magnetic holes entering the magnetosheath, and then something about foreshock transients, um, how they change the pressure distribution, pressure pattern in the magnetosheath, hot flow anomalies and foreshock bubbles um, uh, would be these foreshock transients, and a few slides about magnetosheath jets, what they are, how they are created, and also how they uh, impact then the system downstream and that they work as a coupling element between the foreshock and the bow shock on the one side, all the way through the magnetosheath and then the magnetopause and the magnetosphere on the other side. One thing I want to stress here before uh, finishing this talk is everything that you see on the slides also may apply to other planets and comets. Okay, so this is not unique to the Earth's magnetosheath but in some way or form, all of this can also be found at other planets and, uh, and maybe also in the, in the plasma environment uh, of comets, although this talk is kind of Earth-centric. And uh, I would like uh, to already thank you all and finish my talk with this very nice feature, a uh, very nice picture by Heli Hirtela who draw it for the guest book of one of our um, ECT meetings on jets downstream of collisionless shocks a couple of uh, years ago. And here you can see obviously the real reason for all these turbulent features and all the processes that happen in the magnetosheath and particularly uh, the magnetosheath jets. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you Ferdinand for a great talk. Um, I have a few questions uh, that I'll read out and I'll also note if they're with reference to any specific slide. Uh, so first off, uh, Zubar Shaikh is wondering if the plasma depletion layer can be observed close to the bow shock. And if so, how would it form there? Um, okay, so the, the plasma depletion layer, I think, cannot be observed close to the bow shock. So typical um, so in the subsolar region, typical uh, thicknesses of the plasma depletion layer are something like 0.3 to maybe 1 RE, something like this. And of course, the distance between the subsolar magnetopause and the, and the bow shock um, is something like uh, 5, 4, 5 RE. So, so we see that there is still a large gap. Um, however, if you look into NABET at I2013, you see kind of like a pathological um, magnetosheath crossing where uh, a Thermal spacecraft enters uh, the magnetosheath through the bow shock and then actually the magnetic field keeps increasing all the way th uh, through the subsolar magnetosheath to the magnetopause and goes over without any jump and also the, uh, the, the density is decreasing all the time. So if I would guess this would be would probably be the closest uh, uh, to kind of like a plasma depletion layer de uh, extending over the entire magnetosheath. But this is not, maybe not really the plasma depletion layer because actually at the, mag at the, at the near the magnetopause, you see an increased uh, or, or a, a larger drop actually in the, in the ion density and then a rise in the temperature. Um, so yeah, typical length scales are like 0.3 to 1 RE uh, 
away from the magnetopause. And so, yeah, usually no, the plasma depletion layer would not extend all the way to the Bauschau. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, so Lynn also has a question about the mirror mode waves. Um, he's wondering if the mirror modes are actually slow modes or just a mode similar to the slow mode. Uh, there's been some work by Misha Balakin that suggested that the two waveforms can be differentiated from each other. Okay, so um, I would not immediately know um, how the differentiation would work other than, of course, slow modes maybe should be propagating and, uh, and mirror modes uh, would not be. Um, but definitely mirror modes are kind of slow mode type in, in that they have an anti-correlation of a magnetic field with the density, which is, which is uh, uh, characteristic of the slow mode as well. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Lynn also has a comment with regard to the lion roars. Uh, in the sheath, he thinks it's unlikely that they're going to be a result of the electron heat flux because the straw is highly muted in the sheath. Um, he thinks the biggest issue is that the resonant energies for the cyclotron resonance are in the hundreds of EV to the few KEV and that most people haven't looked at the core halo distribution, but mostly at the temperature anisotropy in the entire distribution. Um, so I think that's more of a comment than a question, but mm -hmm. it just goes to the slide regarding uh, regarding the lion roars formation. Yeah, maybe I can I can add a comment here. So for those who are interested, I think there's a paper by uh, Lynn Wilson from 2013, I believe, uh, looking for Whistler waves near interplanetary shocks, and there actually um, he argues that the um, heat flux instability. Uh, anisotropy instability is actually um, uh, being the root cause of the, those Whistler waves. Nice. Uh, so we have two questions from slide 22. Okay. Let me go. Here we go. All right. So the first is from Stephen Fuselet. Uh, the simulation in the lower right suggests that all of the thin current sheets are associated with magneto C3 connection. Um, however, isn't it true that observational evidence of thin current sheet reconnection in the sheath is relatively rare? Um, it's definitely more rare, I think, than at the magnetopause, but this is just from my feeling from reading papers <laughs> and from the number of papers that you see for both topics. Um, so, um, I mean, maybe it's also I cannot, I have, don't have the answer to this right away. Uh, but I would also su suggest or comment that maybe this is an observational bias because um, when you are dealing with thin current sheet reconnection, of course, you're dealing with much shorter time scales and one would have to make a, first of all, you would have to be at the right place at the right time to observe it, which is maybe difficult if the, if the region that you're observing is even smaller. Um, uh, the second thing might be that that uh, people tend to have uh, tend to look more into larger scale things first, and then smaller things, uh, smaller scale things uh, later. So this might be an observational bias also there. But I don't know. That is the the, the true answer. Ah, great. Thanks. Uh, so Jason Durr on slide twenty two as well is wondering what causes electron only reconnection versus the ion scale, the ion length scale current sheets. Um, okay, also here I have to refer uh, the commenting person to Fun et al 2018, where they kind of like tick the boxes for, for reconnection, but just stress and actually they show the time series and see that there are no ion outflows. So there's, there's no ion scale current sheet um, and just the ion velocity stays the same over the entire time, kind of. And uh, so they don't, they don't observe ion dynamics, but they see electron dynamics that is, uh, um, that is resembling here the reconnection, showing the reconnection. Oh, okay. so, so also here I would, I would refer the, the person to the, to the paper yeah. and maybe to Fan et al directly. If he's actually, if Taifan is here, um, he might be able to answer this. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'll let him unmute himself if he is. Um, our next question is from 
uh, Bijvat Oha on slide 25. Okay. Is there a decrease in the magnetic field strength in magnetic holes? If so, what is the difference between the magnetic holes and the plasma deple depletion layers? And can they be differentiated by satellite observations? Uh, yes. So um, there is a magnetic field uh, depression in magnetic holes, actually pretty substantial. Um, uh, and 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 an increase in in uh, and an increase in the density. Magnetic holes are a feature of the solar wind, so they come in with the solar wind flow, cross the bow shock, are compressed at the bow shock, uh, but then are features that are essentially convected with the magnetic sheath flow. The plasma depletion layer is is uh, opposite or is totally different to that. So a plasma depletion layer does not have a depression of the magnetic field. It has an increase in the magnetic field and lower ion density. So the, the signatures are just opposite to each other. And also the plasma depletion layer is tied to a strongly northward uh, INF or at least to an uh, a solar wind magnetic field that cannot be removed fast enough by reconnection or by the plasma flow and kind of keeps piling up uh, in front of the magnetopause. Um, so you have these opposite signatures and the plasma depletion layer, since this magnetic flux tubes piled up against the magnetopause, it also means that it is inside the magnetosheath a standing structure. It is not like the magneto magnetic holes, a structure that is being convected with the plasma flow uh, through the magnetosheath. And both can be differentiated in that way, also in 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 in, in situ observations. Um, uh, I mean, the flow component would be maybe uh, a minor thing, but definitely the changes in the in the ion density and magnetic field signatures. Okay, great. Um, so our next question is from Elitsevita Antonova. Do you think magnetosheath turbulence has a role in geomagnetic activity? <laughs> um, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so inside the magnetosphere, we don't see almost any uh, of the of the turbulence. So the magnetopause is a very good low pass filter, and we only see low frequency fluctuations kind of coming through the magnetopause and being transmitted into the magnetosphere. Um, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so our final question comes from uh, Luis Prizer. Is there a more physical way to define the boundaries of jets instead of using thresholds based on background or upstream values? Yeah, and that is, um, that's a good question. I mean, at the moment, uh, all the definitions are kind of threshold based and there are different definitions of jets depending on the author or author group. So um, in the papers, for example, in this paper that um, I've written in, in published in 2013, it is, uh, it is um, essentially based on the dynamic pressure passing the certain threshold with respect to the solar wind dynamic pressure. And then there are other definitions, for example, Thomas Carlson is defining magnetosheath plasmoids based on an uh, excess density. And you can also define jets with respect to the ambient uh, plasma parameters. So for example, um, dynamic pressure with respect to the ambient plasma. So with, with respect to a sliding uh, mean average. Um, I hope that we can come at some point to a better definition of jets that would be independent for th certain, certain thresholds. Because at the moment, what this uh, implies, of course, is number one, where is the, the, the physical reasoning for this or that threshold? And when you set a threshold, you also have a level for what you, above that, you would count it as a jet. And below that, uh, what is it? Is it is it just fluctuations that you ignore? So there is a uh, um, you can argue about where the jets begin, and where the coherent structures, also bigger coherent structures, begin that are certainly there, and uh, where fluctuations end. So at the moment there is none. That is the answer to the to the question. Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, so Luis has one more question as well. 
Um, the vortical signature inside jets can be regarded as a consequence or signature of their formation mechanism. Is this a question or a comment? Uh, it's a question. Um, so the signature, the vortical signature um, inside jets may be regarded as a consequence or signature of their formation mechanism different to the heli, heli, heli halo. Um, I'm not so sure about this. I would actually, uh, I'm not sure how to tie this to a, to a definite uh, formation mechanism. Um, oh. So at the moment, I would just see it as, as uh, something that uh, a statistical picture um, that you can see when you observe jets with uh, multiple spacecraft. Um, and you see this vertical motion around jets. You can also see it in, in simulations by Karima Badi et al, for example. So the simulations also have other features that do not necessarily correspond 100% to reality with respect to the jets. Um, but I don't, I would not immediately know how to tie this to a specific generation mechanism, to be honest. Okay. Uh, so our next question comes from Paul. Uh, he's wondering about magic frequencies. What is the signature, if any, in the magneto sheath of magic frequencies that are observed in the solar wind and the magnetosphere? Do you see any ULF waves in the sheath which have frequencies consistent to magic frequencies? I mean, the classical observations are the one that I have inadvertently or advertently shown. And these are, for example, these here by Capco et al. 2002. So uh, just for everybody, magic frequencies are a set of frequencies in the magnetosphere um, where, you see preferentially, where you see preferential oscillations of the magnetospheric field lines. So, so, and these were reported by John Sampson and others in the, in the 90s. Uh, early 90s. And uh, there are a couple of, of uh, models where these frequencies might come from. So classically, these come from uh, magnetospheric cavity or waveguide modes. These, of course, have to be driven somehow, but maybe you have a broadband driver. So these frequencies are not necessarily uh, present already in the magnetic sheath, but you have a broadband driver of these cavity and waveguide modes, and these give you a set of preferential frequencies when they couple to field line resonances. Um, another explanation come, comes here from Capco et al. and uh, uh, Vial et al. in 2008, 2009. There are a couple of papers um, that uh, suggest that these frequencies are already embedded in the solar wind. So you have, and this is what this picture actually shows you. So what you see here are frequencies that, that remind you of the, of, the, of the magic frequencies in this dynamic pressure observations in the, in the solar wind. And then in a magnetospheric, in the magnetic field observations by the GOES-10 spacecraft. And of course, the interesting point here would be that then the oscillator for these frequencies would have to be not at Earth, but maybe at the sun or in the corona. And, and you would get the frequencies there. They would just cross or be across the magnetosheath and then impact on the magnetosphere. And you wouldn't need an, an additional resonator inside the magnetosphere to provide these frequencies. Uh, maybe also um, uh, magnetopause surface waves, standing magnetopause surface waves could also provide these, uh, uh, these magic frequencies uh, inside the magnetosphere because they can also uh, act as a, as a resonator, kind of like a, like a drum that you would hit, for example, with magnetosheath jets, as has been shown by Martin Archer a year ago in a major paper. Okay. So if they were generated in the solar wind, would you expect to see any evidence of them in the sheath? Um, you should. The question is if you can. The problem is here that the, the, the magnetic sheath is a very turbulent plasma. And of course, you have large scale fluctuation already also being transmitted, but you would have to, to filter those out actually. So by eye, you would not be able to see them. But if you take if you if you see them in the in the solar wind, I'm pretty sure you could take a longer time series and 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 do a Fourier analysis to even see them in the magnetic sheet as well. I would expect that. Cool. So our last question comes from uh, Zubair Shayek. Uh, what is the role of the interplanetary magnetic field and dynamic pressure in the formation of jets? Okay. So. Um, the role, the interplanetary magnetic field comes in through the, through the foreshock. Uh, maybe I can go back to the very first uh, slide here. 
yeah, to this slide here. Uh, so you, here you see this, these lines are the interplanetary magnetic field, a sketch of the interplanetary magnetic field. Here you have the foreshock where you have ULF waves forming due to the interaction of reflected ions and, and, and the solar wind. And the, you will, these ULF waves may steepen and develop into short, large amplitude magnetic structures. And these are convected down here to the bow shock where they impact the shock. And so the bow shock here on the, on the quasi parallel side is very different from the bow shock on the quasi perpendicular side. So here, when you go through the bow shock, it's a very, uh, it's a hard jump and it's kind of an ordered shock. Whereas if you go through here, you, you can't even really pinpoint where the shock is because it's a series of ULF waves that steepen. And at a certain point you see, oh, now probably I am in the magnetosheath and here I am in the solar wind, but in between it's a, it's a, it's a mishmash, a mixture of, 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 uh, of magnetic structures that form and reform the shock all the time. And uh, here to light Al, also I believe that probably or maybe it is this bow shock undulations or this rippled and, and unsteady patchy bow shock uh, that facilitates the entry of plasma, either slams that are not decelerated and they pass through such an undulation or simply a, a solar wind plasma that can enter this bow shock and form these jets in the downstream region here. And this, since this jet, when you pass a, for example, in an MHD picture, which of course is, is valid here, but okay, in an MHD picture, if you have an, an undulated uh, uh, bow shock or an undulated shock, the plasma is only decelerated normal to the shock. But if you, if you uh, fly through it with your plasma, it kind of like tangentially, you are very little decelerated, just a little bit deflected. And so you can end up with solar wind plasma that is little decelerated, little heated, and still compressed inside the magnetosheath, uh, forming a jet uh, through this rippled bow shock. And so the, the, the reason or the, the, the connection between the IMF and the occurrence of jets is really through the foreshock, because the certain IMF direction will lead to a foreshock at a certain position, that will lead to, you lead to ULF waves and then slams being created in the foreshock, being convected to the bow shock, impinging it, forming the rippled bow shock. And then that facilitates the entry of other slams or solar wind plasma into the magnetosheath that are, is then detected as the jets. And that is where the real connection is. Ah, great, thank you. So that's all of our questions today. Uh, thanks again, Ferdinand, for a wonderful talk. Um, you were really thorough and thank you for presenting. Thank you very much. Uh, for everyone else, we don't have a talk next week as it is Memorial Day in the US, but we will continue on June 1st with the Magneto Pause by Ying Zhao. So we look forward to seeing everyone in two weeks time. Thank you again, Ferdinand, and have a good week, everyone. <laughs>